Thank you for uh, your presentations, and I think we have um, a lot of interesting questions that can, can be made now. So we'd like to start with the question of, of scale. And I think we all agree that uh, performance, materiality, and, and scale are three things that needs to be bring to, together. And uh, what do you think that our, as an architect we can do to fulfill this, this gap that is not allowing us to go beyond a certain scale as we talked before, the screens or, or the pavilion? I don't know if you want to start. I think there's the physical scale, obviously, of the installation. But I think what I'm also trying to address the scale of the, the, the model, like this, the, the simulation, like the the way we even judge uh, what we are designing. So I think the artifact creation is, is one part of it, right? but um, I think some of the more pressing issues are in a sense not just the implementation question of like the machinery, can you scale up, uh, let's say 3D printers to house size, but it's, I think I'm also just quite perplexed as I was trying to point out with the power, with the tower, uh, the, the types of control systems or the type of uh, design systems, if we actually entrust them more authority how do we make sure that their uh, implications also scale? Um, so it isn't just considering uh, a very sort of limited domain of, of knowledge or a very limited domain of input to make decisions which obviously have a bigger impact also at larger scale in terms of resources, in terms of impact, in terms of how long these structures stand. Right? So I'm, it's, I think to me it's a twofold problem. It's not just the how can we make the stuff. I'm not sure if it's already there that it's justified, as was also pointed out by Branko very nicely in the, the, the sort of complex simplicity or simple uh, complexity <coughs> that uh, I think it's a maturing process that has to happen in all levels, right? So um, maybe it's a good thing that it isn't yet easy to scale up these um, constructs uh, using the sort of just a simple yeah, machine type logic brought to architectural scale because I think there's many more interdependencies which we don't model at all currently, right? With just a lot of hand waving uh, or just scaling traditional uh, approaches and not really questioning them. So. Uh, actually, I want to address that briefly too. Um, uh, for people who are interested in, in exploring new materials, uh, the question of, of, of scale is the question. Um, in our group, we've been working with the um, muscle wire, the flexinol or nitinol, so those of you who are into Arduinos and things of that sort. It's a, a metal wire that if you run it's a shape memory alloy, so in other words, you, I think the audience understands what shape memory alloy is, I don't have to explain it, but we were able to um, create models that behave dynamically by embedding nitinol wire into plastic tubing, which is then embedded into resin sheets and, and so on. So, and we're imagining buildings that then begin to examine the same, the same behavior, and of course, you know, try to imagine a nitinol wire, you know, that is three inches in diameter, and the amount of electricity that will have to go through it in order to you know, exhibit the same, the same behavior. So, which I guess is one reason why you're working with Festo muscles, like pneumat pneumatics, because I think you know, when one shifts from that scale where you can have material change you know, simply by applying electricity to it, like you then have to resort to pneumatics when you blow it up at the scale, at the scale of the building. So, there is a kind of fundamental disconnect you know, between the kinds of models, uh, scale models that we work with, and the actual full scale, uh, full scale of the building. And I really admire you know, your, your ambition to, to work with a tower that can you know, deform and, and shift and, and change its configuration uh, dynamically. There is a fellow who does something similar, Tristan Destes Turk in, 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 in Chicago. So just imagine a tower that has 30 stories that would you know, flex dynamically as you know, shown by Axel in, 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 his, in his presentation. So these are far from being, uh, far from being uh, trivial. Thank you, but just, just picking what you were saying also from your presentation and going back to the material, mm -hmm. can we really make the, instead of being just constrained from the materials, can you really think as material as a potential to, or a strength to develop uh, a material process, I mean, a project from the material itself, the qualities of material, and how we, with the technologies and with the design, can we manipulate the conditions and the qualities of the material? 
Yep, there is a there is a very good project by um, uh, Enric Ruiz Gelli, uh, the Media Tic in mm -hmm. Barcelona Excellent. that again uses pneumatics but in a different way, uh, pneumatics as a skin of the building, where he um, uh, inflates and deflates the skin in order to give it you know shading properties. Properties it's the uh, ETFE foil, uh, and then uh, they have invented. Uh, the introduction of nitrogen into the airspace between two plastic sheets that kind of turns it from being transparent to something that is translucent mm -hmm. and then blocks the UV, UV rays. So it was as, as simple, as, simple as, as working with air as a kind of material and then introducing another gas that again you know, changes the properties of the entire, uh, entire facade. Okay. So that would be kind of my, my example of how we can work with materials that could uh, again, operate at the scale, at the scale of the building. And I, <coughs> I would say, I think there's a, a few different aspects. One is, I guess, the glorification of the actual creation of completely novel materials on the sort of molecular scale, mm -hmm. of which I think is a val very valid uh, research track. But I, th I think it also requires a substantial education and, I mean, an actual background to do that properly at the cutting edge, which may not be the thing that most architects get engaged with yet, right? That may also change and is changing to some degree, right? But, but if, uh, so that's one possible trajectory, but I think it's not the only one. I think it's also the actual use of existing materials in a much more independent way to actually find, I mean, find the gaps at the large scale, right? So the scale, not just the scale of the dimension of the constructs, but also the huge uh, interdependencies at like a building in the city uh, with all the resource flows, uh, with all the sort of long range sort of uh, modeling of the impacts of, of a structure over 30 years, uh, the behavior cycles, how people actually interact with that structure as part of the embodied intelligence of the structure. It's not just the, the systems, but it's the people in them. Right? So I think the, the frontier there is so far out still mm -hmm. um, that I feel that's, I mean, that's part where the architecture expertise can also re really come in, how to really more intelligently mix materials and make them work to their best, right? And not just for engineering optimization minimalism, which we have seen basically over the last 50, 60 years, but also a much wider range of, of sort of optimization criteria. And the last thing also, to really occupy that spectrum uh, of scale where you have sort of the molecu molecular level of behavioral material, but then also sort of the macro scales in between where it's just before, let's say, assembly, um, and like 3D printed parts often have that, right? You can do sort of a complexity at a level which is yeah. bigger than material, uh, like molecular level, but it can be assembled by hand, right? For acoustic properties, for all kinds of other uh, types of properties, which is still being very little addressed on this sort of construction scale. So I feel there's a few areas that go beyond just this sort of being a very hard problem, right? Uh, the, the invention of completely novel materials, mm -hmm. where architecture and engineering types, uh, system designs can also make a big difference still. Yes, and be the material becomes uh, a tool also that you can work with. Yes. And still, in, you know, in a way, still restricted to the envelope you know, so far. Like, it will be interesting to see how these uh, technologies per, uh, migrate to the interior and how, I mean, just. Uh, um, new research kind of um, blends into the space and, uh, and it goes beyond it, which is difficult. Yeah, but I, I think uh, uh, Axel was right to say that we do not actually you know, have to uh, constantly look for new materials, that we can actually make uh, a very good use of already existing and well understood uh, uh, palette that we work with. Uh, the project that I shown by um, um, Herzog and the Meron, the Eberswalde Library, actually has images imprinted, imprinted on concrete. So uh, in their case, they found a fabricator and they worked with Dupont, the, the chemical manufacturer, to come up with a, with a way of, of, of translating a grayscale image through a chemical that would then eat into the surface of the concrete to give us the illusion of the kind of grayscale, grayscale image. Uh, think of um, Adolf Loss and what he did on his villas where he actually had a, essentially flat surfaces, but very rich wood inlays, where he actually exploited the, the, the rich texturing of the wood and, and how you can, you can then create these visually compelling interiors you know, with incredibly simple geometries, but, but uh, um, as I said, visually complex and visually engaging. So it, it depends what we want to tease out of the material. You know, what are we looking for? Um, 
how it, it, it uh, defines uh, spatially, how it defines visually, or whether we are seeking out a material that would have a particular strength or would you know, perform in some um, other uh, terms uh, in terms of building physics, uh, acoustically, uh, thermally, uh, and so on. I mean, there's a range of new materials you know, that are out there, but that work at a kind of rather small scale. And as I said, you know, as, you, as you pointed out in the opening statement, you know, the scale of deployment then becomes one of the, the key, uh, key issues. Well, I guess the, the next question we kind of want to ask you, because from your experience, I think there's um, a lot of information flying from process to image, especially as uh, in, in a network society where images travel uh, in instantaneously. How your research, you come from uh, top um, universities doing uh, very um, sophisticated research, how this uh, research gets translated or mistranslated and eventually becomes the core of the discipline or how other architects apply um, your, uh, or their research done in top inst institutions uh, within the dialectics of uh, process and image. Uh, but there is a long history of misappropriation. Yeah, in, yeah. no, it's not a bad in, thing. In, in <laughs> architecture, I think, you know, Greg Lynn's work at at Columbia, you know, was a misappropriation of software that was actually made for Jurassic Park-like movies, and then he used that software to 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 uh, to great effect to kind of launch this um, range of explorations in time-based modeling. So that was, I think, one of the first first steps uh, uh, at the time. Uh, our research group uh, is interested actually in stealing as much as we can from from others. So we actually look into medicine. Um, biology, material science, and, and we are very interested in what they are doing because now almost everybody is using computation in some way. And what we are discovering is that these computational techniques are actually transportable, so to speak. You just have to imagine a different context. I have a colleague, you know, who looked into the medicine and the use of software that simulates blood clotting. So, like when you cut yourself, the body mobilizes the resources, you know, uses its capillary network and delivers the material where it's needed. It turns out you can use the same software to simulate uh, emergencies in urban situations. So it's like where you have a problem in a city, you have a uh, capillary network that again, the infrastructure of the city, and you can actually literally use the same technique and the same simulation software in a very different, uh, different, different context. So I would say that, that there is a tremendous potential for innovation simply by looking into what others are doing and then reimagining the context in which their computational techniques are being uh, deployed, reimagining that context, in, and again, in whether it's a building uh, or, or a city. I agree to some de degree, but also uh, at the same time, I feel that is. Not literally, not no. literally transcribed. But I think that is, that is one of the big uh, potential crises in the field, also, right? because I think. The sort of and to, to accept that that there's no need for a substantial investment in in creating um, really novel design specific models of, of computation of design etc uh, is is ultimately I think well it's just not going to happen on its own and mm -hmm. the other disciplines are doing that uh, mm -hmm. with many many researchers many years and decades of work to to develop such computational models right, to fit exactly to their research problem uh, and I feel. The appropriation is great because there is a shared layer, uh, but at the same time, I think it's getting easier and easier to stick with trajectories that have been laid out for very, very different yeah. purposes right? and also different values. Right? And ultimately, that's the question, how do we represent uh, design and also how we evaluate it? Um, and so I think the, sort of the, the, the complete reliance on geometry currently is mm -hmm. such a thing, I think. It's, it's great and it's very powerful, but it certainly doesn't capture the majority of the values we care or probably should or do care um, for in, in architecture. So as these things get more complex, the ability to act upon other um, uh, values other than the form and geometric parameters becomes more and more one of just picking right? or liking or not liking, right? but not actually ingraining it into the, into the generative process. So I feel we have to be careful, not cautionary, right? but to also actually invest in the, in the creation of design-specific computational models, which may not be a month work, may not be a PhD, may be actually a disciplinary long-term stretch, because otherwise 
uh, yeah, we're just waiting and sort of appropriating, but also don't educate people to take this as a take this on as a, as a real challenge, which may may take more time than we are accustomed to in design. Well, I agree, but you know, I also have to say, you know, I'll give you another example. Uh, we have uh, in, in Calgary, where I'm now, um, probably a top expert um, in the simulation of plant growth. Uh, you may have heard of Lindemeyer Systems. So this fellow, Przemyslav Prosinkiewicz, and his group, he has 25 PhD students. <coughs> they created a software called Dell Studio, where the ambition is to model not a single tree or a single plant, but actually entire forests. So what they're doing is something called environmental mapping. So for a forest to grow, you need to know the topography, the insulation, the composition of the soil, the level of humidity, and, and, and so on. So all of that gets embedded in this kind of environmental engine. And you know, what we thought was that we can take that environmental engine and actually define what are the environmental inputs. And we don't want to grow, grow the, the, the trees, but we want to grow houses. So we actually tried to appropriate that, uh, that software uh, and not literally use it, but actually adapt it to, to, to our context. It was a colossal failure. You know, it, it didn't work because this group of my students didn't have the computational capacity that they had in the other, in, or agility, not capacity, agility to kind of quickly change the computational models. But what I'm trying to say is that computation is a, is a kind of powerful uh, language for transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary work. And uh, I'm, we are discovering that, that people in other disciplines, in medicine, biology, are, are really actually thrilled to work with us. And they find it mind-boggling, you know, that we find their work uh, uh, interesting, and that, that we would like to kind of mess around with. with. And they're actually, uh, uh, quite frankly, uh, equally uh, astonished that some of their own computational models, you know, could operate at the scale of the of the built environment. Which uh, probably brings to the table the next question, which is code versus uh, product. And uh, of course, you're, you're very, very experienced in. Mm -hmm. In coding and in, in, in bridging these two uh, uh, problems and all the stages that the co from code to product imply, and where do you see the gaps and where do you see, uh, from your perspective, the potentials of the, the potentiality of the discipline to cope with these things? I mean, I showed a little bit of the processes in my projects, mm -hmm. which I refer to sometimes as the dirty digital. There's so many gaps in them. Um, which is, is good. Yeah, which is basically, I think it's important to acknowledge the gaps and to also formalize them and mm. describe them because they are potential research <coughs> opportunities to, to focus on either to, to fill them out, to, to make the links that are missing, or also to redefine the problem such that more of it is possible in the current approach of, of computation or, or, or code or algorithmic sort of um, working. But I feel it's important to also, that's how I teach studio, to keep the, the design challenge, the agenda, really the dominant aspect, and to try to invent the algorithm and the code around it, mm -hmm. and fill out the gaps if needed with other things, to not let it distort the challenges, <coughs> which are often much harder than what is really possible in computation currently, as opposed to adopting computational processes that are elegant and work, and then producing with them, which mm -hmm. is, is great, much more productive. Mm -hmm. But I feel as an open-ended challenge, I think we have to take design serious as and the problems we encounter uh, with it and see that as a challenge, what we need to actually build up in computation uh, in order to have a long-term uh, effect. Right? Mm -hmm. But uh, so in that sense, the code to me is always, it's an, it's an enabler, but it's also a way to externalize understanding and relationships that have been formed over time and then um, basically act, act upon them in an externalized product, uh, which then allows me to probably deal with many more constraints and dependencies than I could have in my mind uh, in a sort of explicit manner. Uh, so then the product hopefully becomes also more explorative, so I can do many more instances of something that uh, would require a lot of work otherwise. So in a way you see the product as process? No, I don't think it's, uh, I would never be uh, uh, satisfied with just basically celebrating the process as the mm -hmm. final result. I, I think it is something to, to, to focus on research-wise, definitely, to, to further it, right? but ultimately the product also has, has to live up to many, mm -hmm many criteria, so not all of them, as I said, are covered by our current state of computation. So we shouldn't lose that sensibility, but at the same time, don't use it as an excuse to not engage the, the difficult challenge. So, but that's, as I said before, a long-term 
a longer term thing than usually a, a single project lasts, right? And I think we have to develop that, like in programs like here, right? mm -hmm. that sensibility and that patience to invest in that, right? Uh, otherwise, it's not happening. Right? Uh, it's actually a very good question. In, in, in one of the seminars that I teach, uh, I actually ask the students to not go for a particular product, but actually to invent the process first and, and foremost. And then once, once we have a process, then we can imagine different products uh, coming uh, out of it. And that kind of leads to um, calibration of the process. <coughs> um, and I'll give you one, I didn't show it in my presentation, but um, I had a student who uh, simply carved out a volume from a simple box, mm -hmm. cut out the box into the kind of series of layers, mm -hmm. and then delaminated the box, introduced slight gaps, mm -hmm. and that produces a very dynamic effect you know, as you move along. Mm -hmm. uh, so he came up with something that was um, interesting, and then we said, okay, now what this could be? It could be a facade system, a rain screen, could be a set of acoustic panels along the side you know, of, the, of the highways, could be a lampshade, and so on. And the moment you give it a scale, and a product definition that then actually directs the process in a, in a particular way. But it started very open-ended, like without prescribing what the products are, but mm -hmm. simply as a kind of open-ended investigation of geometry uh, and, and, uh, and, and assembly, in this case. Mm -hmm. Box, carved out, sliced, uh, and, and then that opened up. You know, if I ask him to design a rain screen, I don't think he would have come up with that solution. Or if, he, if I ask him you know, to des design an acoustic barrier along the highway, I don't think that innovation would have taken, uh, taken place. Yeah, I'm sorry to just a small comment. And this somehow loops back to the, to the question of process and image, because once your mm -hmm. student work gets published, it kind of grows. And uh, because someone sees it on the, on the net, uh, uh, downloads an uh, algorithm, and then it starts playing around with it, and then it starts to, to be uh, Degraded or <laughs> in <or> yes. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. And and then I think we go again back to the the process and versus versus materiality. So I think before we had a hierarchy that we will design and someone else would build them. Now we also as you mentioned we are in a process of trial error and we are always evolving from thing that you start from. It's not something linear that goes from point A to point B. But there are lots of things happening in between that. So what do you think should be the relation between the material and the design process? Should one drift the other one? Should they work parallelly? Or is one a constraint of the other one? You answered the question. So it's, it's all of the all of the things that you mentioned. So you can start with the material and then tease out a product out of it. We can start with the product and look for the material that fits it perfectly. Or you can work on both. Uh, um, simultaneously. So all of those trajectories are perfectly, perfectly valid. Is that because you became, we became the homophaber? Or the is makers? That, yes. Well, The Economist magazine recently ran a, uh, a cover story of about the third industrial revolution, uh, where they're saying that 3D printing is going to revolutionize how things are, things are made. So just like we all now have laser printers, I think we'll all have 3D printers uh, soon. Um, you know, when I first encountered a laser printer, uh, Hewlett Packard laser jet, uh, it was uh, in mid-80s. That printer was $6,000. So in today's money, it would be like paying for a laser printer, almost $15,000. How many of you would pay $15,000 for a laser printer today? Nobody. But that's what 3D printers cost today. So you can fast forward to say a decade or two decades from now, and imagine the kind of 3D printing technology that, that we, will, we will have. So I have to agree with the folks at The Economist magazine that uh, we are on the verge of a kind of huge shift in, in how things are manufactured and, and, and made. And everybody would then become much more familiar with, I guess, the, kind of, the kinds of things that we, we use to make things. It's also related with, I guess, with the democratization of the technologies. And as yeah. you were saying, like, we become, maybe it will happen that we are going to have a desk, desktop 3D printer. So we kind of have already the cheap version of that. But in a while. Crude version, we, yes. Yeah. Crude and cheap version. Yeah. Crude and expensive version, I should say. <laughs> we'll have cheap and sophisticated versions. Yeah, so, so. But at the same time, there's a pushback, I guess, towards the maker sort of culture, which yes. actually does not want to relent yes. control. Towards a potential 
like very controlled uh, pipeline of production that you may have a few producers of 3D printers who then have a monopoly on the material and mm -hmm. the patents to produce it and suddenly it's like ink jet printers right? where basically you're, you're bound and right? you have to pay your dealer for more ink to print things when in fact you could produce it yourself right? but you, you've lost the ability or sensibility to do so. Uh, so I think it's, it's an interesting uh, question. I'm, I'm intrigued by it but I'm also a little bit uh, yeah, wondering, as in all these techniques, not so much what is lost, right? But how can you keep it a multi, multi uh, sort of uh, thread exploration right, of different approaches uh, and actually work also with uh, using other types of materials which isn't just heated up plastic or heated up, uh, but let's say, how, how does wood play into that? Um, do you grow, custom grow things to yeah. achieve these types of structures? So just the breadth of sensibility and, and possibilities and also the, the redundancies of of, of processes of creation uh, so to keep that intact, right? And not replace it with one fit all, right? Um, yeah. I agree, but we also I think it's also dangerous because when you start listening about 3D printing wood, we just reduce all the qualities that wood has mm -hmm. to powder, and then you can just do the same. It's kind of strange how we can just waste all the opportunities we have when a material that is. Um, heterogeneous and, and isotropic, so and you just transform it in an homogeneous material. It could be plastic, it could be something else. So I think you're right. You need to be really careful in the boundary between what is material and the process. So don't get on on this kind of uh, track. Because quite frankly, just to the material, I think 3D printing. Not I think. I'm sure everybody agrees, but it's an extremely primitive process. Right? So mm -hmm. it's glorified as something. But if you look at how nature produces material, it's a very different process. Right? Mm -hmm. And much more differentiated. There's no larger machine that puts things where they should be, right? So I think there's a whole other set of, of, of actual form, formation of, of objects and, and uh, yeah, of matter for that matter, right? That where 3D printing, I think 20 years looks extremely, well, looks extremely silly or, or strange, right? As a leftover of a sort of industrial, like a mechanical engineering type solution to the problem. Even when you talk uh, about the scaling up, when you yeah. talk about counter crafting or this kind of project. Well, I think it would be interesting to contemplate, you know, the parallel with, with desktop publishing and printing. Like when the laser printers came out uh, and, you know, the Macs with the fonts and so on, uh, suddenly everybody imagined or fashioned himself or herself as a graphic designer. So <laughs> there were lots of um, unfortunate, ugly newsletters that got, got, got produced. But I think it, 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 it simply raised awareness of the kind of quality of design and the world of design and kind of plays in that, that realm. So as these fabrication technologies, you know, whether it's CNC milling or 3D printing, um, enter the mainstream and as, as these machines become cheaper, again, we will see this proliferation of, of making, which I think, you know, we should, we should in, in embrace, which will then lead to the appreciation of design and the kind of quality of craft, because, you know, things still need to fit well, they need to be you know, finally, um, if in a kind of fine way crafted and assembled in order to get something that performs and functions well in the end. So there'll be lots of crude, badly looking and badly put together kind of contraptions. Uh, like I think of the kind of robots that you, that you, you put together, they're very crude, but they, they kind of um, illustrate the possibilities that, uh, that, that are emerging. We already have the fab at home, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is, I, I just read, read an article that, that uh, well, this is not a new idea that you could, you know, 3D print the entire house. Uh, maybe. I have been saying for a quite long time, but we didn't see it yet. <laughs> well, there are quite a few people, you know, who, who are imagining uh, printing at that uh, at that scale. And it's, it's you know, certainly an intriguing, uh, intriguing idea. But then again, you know, you begin to think about all the kind of building systems that need to go into the, the building. There is Bernard Koshnevis. There is. Uh, uh, yeah, there are yeah. quite a few, quite a few people in who are operating that way. Helicopters assembling buildings. That was another one. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the same guys, the same guys who did that table. I don't know if you've seen it. Fabio Carmazia and, and, and Matthias Koller actually they have GPS controlled little helicopters that the are assembling. Yes, assembling. It's a really cool project. Talking about the energy footprint of the. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the high rise. But each brick has the same energy. Well, probably this this point could be addressed as uh, extensive and uh, intensive somehow. Where um, you just point, I think it was Axel uh, said that na natural processes work in a very different way, much more complex, much more uh, uh, intricate uh, processes. So, where do you see uh, 
the discipline or your practice is going towards a more um, simul to a, mo a better understanding of simultaneity and how these material processes get bred or get get put together. Um, well, I'm I'm careful. I mean, I've, first of all, I'm not working on that problem, so I'm not claiming that. This is the way necessary. I mean, I don't have any knowledge mm. about it in depth. And also, I wouldn't glorify nature. Uh, it's just that it's fascinating. Glorify as in that's mm. the right way to do it. It's more like that nature has to do with so many constraints to actually do something autonomously and under really uh, like scarce resources of energy, of material that's available. In that sense, it's an amazing process, which if you take a 3D printer, which is powered by a power plant, mm. which is, I don't know, 200 miles away, right? uh, using materials that are shipped in from all over the world right? to then make a little thing which is probably, I don't know, 100 times more energy than the same structure that would be grown in a petri dish on the side. Right? Uh, I think that's more to, it's not the fetishization of nature, it just does it all right, but to understand under which constraints that system produces something. Right? And that's been the benchmark, I guess, uh, which may be achieved to very different processes. Right? Uh, so it's not so much that it has to grow, that it has to be alive or anything like this, right? but to, to really take, it, take this, the achievement as a benchmark which one could live up to it right? and to look at the sort of industrial processes which are hugely distributed, have lot, many hidden costs and many hidden innovations, so to say, that make it possible to do something locally, um, to not forget that, basically. Mm. So that has maybe something with sequential and simultaneity that it's uh, to actually never look at the process as an isolated entity, but to take into account what else is necessary to make it happen, which becomes particularly important at building scales, right? because you have the network grows exponentially as the products get bigger. Um, going back, that's a very good, good point that Axel is main, making, and, and going back to the question of, 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 um, of, of materials, I just recalled the work of um, Anna Heringer uh, from Austria, who uh, work with um, the poor in Bangladesh, uh, fashioning uh, two-story houses out of mud and straw, where is essentially the addition of straw to the mud was the kind of important material innovation in that context that actually enabled these mud houses to be turned from one-story to two-story buildings and, and kind of gave it credibility as a, as a, as a building material. It's fascinating work. Uh, again, uh, Herringer is uh, her last name, Anna was actually uh, a thesis project at the graduate level that uh, led to this kind of tremendous material innovation, with huge social and economic consequences for much of the kind of developing, uh, developing world. So you don't have to look into the kind of lat latest polymers, you know, just mud and straw can actually do some amazing, uh, amazing things for quite a few people. Do you think uh, just to, to finalize, the relation, the relation between form and performance have been seriously discussed. And what do you think that, um, to which extent do you think we have gained knowledge on the field of the material process that can influence or change the dynamics of architectural design now? Not, not just in the sense of dynamic change in, the, in a certain time frame, but also the way we produce and the way you see architecture now? Uh, you're looking at Branco? I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at that. <laughs> no, no, <sorry. laughs> I have another one of my monologues now. Um, I'm, uh, well, I'm very quite intrigued by the notion of performance, right? In the sense of, because it's so important how you measure it, right? what you actually perceive as optimal. It depends so hugely on what you pay attention to. So it was a little bit the argument before, how big do you draw the envelope, the, the sort of boundary around what you evaluate, right? So nature probably draws it very small because it doesn't have the, the ability to, to do it other than an ecosystem, which of course is another whole level of complexity. But um, like so ultimately the solution space you get is hugely dependent obviously at how you evaluate anything within that. Right? And just before I was discussing with, uh, with Greg, Greg Lynn about sailing, there's an outright speed record right now since about 30 years or 40 years, about how to go the fastest with a sailing vessel with a person inside. And basically the solution range currently from a sort of four or five kilo kite surfing uh, rig to a sort of 15 ton trimaran uh, on the open ocean. Right? Both, th both of these solutions are competing within a few knots around this hugely contentious uh, um, uh, record. Right? So it just shows that if you're un unconstrained, it's an open, open outright record. If you're unconstrained, the solution space, you get radically different 
uh, uh, possibilities often, uh, very surprising ones, uh, which I think in traditional sense often doesn't happen because we don't accept them as solutions. And also they take time. Uh, for instance, the kite surfing took about 10 or 15 years to reach that level. Right? So you could have shut it down immediately in the beginning saying there's no, no point in it. Right? Uh, so I think we need to really look in the performance form envelope for allowing really un unfit solutions, so to say, to, to evolve and to, to perpetuate, um, <coughs> especially if they address larger, harder problems. Right? Uh, to not shoot them down constantly just because they can compete at the very moment when the decision is being made. Right? Uh, and also our computational systems have to evolve, and that was my critique around being so geometric dependent. Right. So if you measure everything and optimize everything through grasshopper and uh, genetic algorithms, and not grasshopper to be blamed, but geometric system ultimately. Right? The majority of things you will evaluate as numerical entities that are geometrically linked. Right? So, uh, so it's all going, going through very, very small loopholes, so to say, uh, to press other values that may be much more difficult to describe in these entities and have them also be a valid solution outcome in these systems. Right? So I don't have this, the answer to it. I, sh I just think it's, it's very important to leave room for experimentation and failure always in the systems so these things have a chance to evolve, to become competitors in the near or longer future. Um, and I feel our systems of design and, and models play a large role in that. Right? because they uh, sort of um, yeah, allow other certain expressions to be much more dominant and much more prevalent mm -hmm. than others. The, um, the subject of performance is a, is a, is a, is a loaded one in, 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 our, um, in our discipline because it essentially connotes um, two different things. Uh, it connotes uh, an event um, or a measure. That's essentially how we can think of um, performance in, uh, in, in architecture, uh, which again ties us to the very subject of, of this event, translating the intangible, because the, the things that we can measure are tangible things. So we can kind of optimize them. Uh, and the other realm, the realm of events, is where some of the intangibles come, come into play, and those sorts of things are kind of difficult to, to model uh, and, and even more difficult to, uh, uh, to, to measure. So, uh, like, like Axel, you know, I would be you know, asking for some specificity uh, when it comes to, to performative agendas. Uh, and I would um, always uh, aim for um, multivariable optimization instead of aiming to optimize a single variable, say energy performance of a, of a building. And I think much of the current focus in the built and the building industry is on, on optimizing energy uh, performance at the expense of other performances that are not necessarily uh, tangible in the context of architecture. Or to be more blunt, we have some energy, incredibly energy efficient buildings that are also incredibly ugly. Mm -hmm. So uh, ugliness obviously is, is not something that could be, could be uh, uh, quantified. So there is a kind of Sorry to interrupt. Uh, there's a request in the discipline for ambiguity to a certain degree. No, not ambiguity. I, I mean, I would I would argue for for kind of specificity, but the the the, the, the kind of avoidance of what I would call kind of single variable uh, op optimization. So, you know, which is why I like to show that that first one of the first slides in my presentations on complexity, I started with a kind of social and cultural, you know, realm, and then progressed into programmatic, formal, spatial. And, and so on. So building physics, um, you know, thermal, structural, acoustic, as just a kind of one of the tiles in this kind of large mosaic that's called building. Uh, and instead of, you know, we shouldn't you know, go for the lime green tile, so to speak, that sticks out. And this is the thing that we are optimizing, but you have to kind of have the, the entire picture uh, in mind. Although I would argue a single, single really true single value optimization could actually produce the radical outcomes. It's just they, I think I when agree. we talk about single value, we actually yes. uh, sort of block out the solutions that would actually be the but true solutions. But in a generative sense, but in a generative yeah. sense, not in terms of kind of arriving at some, not that being the design driver, mm -hmm. but being part of the process. Mm 
Yeah, but let's say a high rise, like a lot of yeah. uh, the current design is around how much carbon footprint was reduced for 80 story high rise uh, being built uh, as a huge success. But if you would look at yeah. other ways to minimize the energy use of these people, maybe you'd come up with a very different, maybe a tent city would be much better yeah. or a well insulated tent city. Yeah. Um, so it's let's call focus. Yeah, but then <laughs> the solution would be would be dismissed, right? The single parameter optimization would be dismissed as not valid, right? And why is that? Well, because the value system wasn't included in the sense that we value a certain levels of comfort or a certain level of image uh, in the structures that are being built as higher than the actual optimization uh, question of, of energy use. So I feel that's a big big um, challenge also. Uh, to actually accept the solutions that we do arrive at uh, as, as, as necessary ones, mm -hmm. as opposed to one like a, a, a mistake in the system. So but as part of the process, not as a final final product. Yeah. Okay, so we, we, we have to end up our session. Uh, thanks to Branko and Axel uh, for Thank coming you. and for smart comments. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.